You uh, have been active as a musician, educator, composer, and an ethnomusicologist. Um, I'm kind of interested to know, uh, Alexandre, what is an ethnomusicologist? Um, ethnomusicology is a field that studies music um, as a sociocultural phenomenon. And the ultimate goal is to understand human beings by studying culture through music. So it's kind of like anthropology of music. Okay. Um, you perform a whole variety of musical styles here. It says in my bio, classical, jazz, rock, and non-Western music on a double bass guitar, piano, and percussion. Uh, out of curiosity, why so many different uh, fields of music? Why so many styles? Oh, because I got interested in uh, different styles. Um, I'm classically trained, but I studied jazz as well. And years ago, I played pop and rock like everyone else. And I uh, was very curious to uh, play, learn to understand, and, and get a deeper uh, perspective on what one feels uh, when one playing different musical cultures and different styles as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I seem kind of out of it. It's just, when I saw the stream was only 15 minutes, I totally lost track of everything, but... Um, let me see what else I could talk about here. I, I apologize for not seeming ready here, but uh, all right, here's something. Uh, for the past eight years, you have been researching the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound from Western scientific, Eastern philosophical, and shamanic societal belief perspectives. I guess we'll take this bit by bit. Um, researching the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound from a Western scientific standpoint. All right, tell us all about the uh, Western scientific uh, standpoint aspect of this. You got the floor. Hmm. So basically, I wanted to understand uh, what sound is from the standpoint of physics, acoustics specifically, and uh, also neuroscience, how sound impacts the brain, what happens in the brain <clears throat> when one is listening, applying different types of listening, because all listen in the same way. Um, and also how it changes uh, neurochemistry in the body. And uh, also studying sound from the standpoint of mathematics, because sound is really mathematics that you're listening to, or mathematical ratios. And I also incorporated into my study philosophy, specifically phenomenology, which deals with the study of an experience, the mechanics of an experience, and um, also psychology and anthropology and ethnomusicology. So it's very important to take a multidisciplinary approach when studying something as complex as sound, because <clears throat> we can see that everybody's infatuated with sound, and it's a, it's a versatile and powerful medium has been used in a wide variety of different contexts religious, sacred, secular, in ceremonies for healing and trance and transcendence, and, and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, now the, uh, well, I, I'm really not so sure uh, how many of them you were trying to cover in that one answer. I, I wanted to do this a little bit by bit from first the Western scientific standpoint, the Eastern philosophical standpoint, and the shamanic societal beliefs perspectives. I really wanted to try to to compare and contrast them. So, uh, I mean, I guess I'm, the, a fair way to ask, ask this question is, um, could you maybe compare and contrast the um, Western scientific and the Eastern uh, philosophical um, perspectives? Because uh, a lot of people would, would find it a little strange that you would put the word scientific with Western and philosophical with Eastern. And I'm kind of interested to know w why the difference there in choice of words. So could you please uh, compare and contrast Western and Eastern um, viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I'm interested in how sound was used in Eastern philosophies, such as uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Sikhism, Brahmanism, and, and so on, because um, the function of sound in these Eastern philosophies, and they're called philosophies more than religions, really. I mean, Buddhism is the philosophy of the mind. Um, they're not to be perceived as religions uh, based on what they deal with. It, they're, they're more treated as philosophies, a way of living, a way of trying to understand 
the psyche, nature, uh, the mind, and, and so on in Hinduism. Try to understand archetypes, these thousands of gods that one would find in Hinduism. They're not to be perceived as gods, but more like archetypes. So basically, in all of these ancient philosophies, uh, sound has been extensively used, uh, especially in um, mantra and sutra systems and in chant. And uh, it's true that contemporary religions, the three contemporary book religions, or the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, had this awareness of uh, the power of sound. And <clears throat> that I don't like so much the way sound was used in these religions because of uh, the agenda that was behind it, because these book religions used sound and capitalized on its power. So I wanted to understand how the ancients used sound to enhance the understanding of human consciousness, the psyche, and the invisible word. Thank you. And last but not least, what did you say? What did you say? I was saying, is that a little clearer now? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, definitely. Now? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, I was just uh, toying around with the sound there because I hear someone in the chat room saying that um, – Guest volume is very low, but my volume is high. I don't know what's going on with the volume because I had to postpone a show last night because of this. But anyway, I've already said that. So uh, uh, let's move on to the um, shamanic societal belief perspective. Maybe you did already cover this a little bit in your um, in what you just said here. But this whole uh, the idea of uh, shamanics, a lot of people have different um, takes on what that word shamanic means. A lot of people think it has to do with uh, with healing. But um, like shamans, they are healers. But there seems to be a lot of other um, uh, definitions that people associate with the word shamanic. So I guess um, for your for your purposes, what you do with sound meditation and music and all that, uh, tell us uh, what exactly is the uh, shamanic societal belief perspective? So <clears throat> shamans uh, can also be called medicine men and healers and various terms. The word shaman itself was adopted from um, Siberian Tungusic language uh, because of a Russian anthropologist who was studying uh, Siberian shamanic cultures, and uh, that word shaman means the one who knows. And it was uh, introduced into European culture in, if I remember well, in 1897. And um, ever since, the word shaman has been used throughout the world because of the Western influence. And even now in the Amazon basin, uh, people who do the work of a shaman now are called shamans. So, <clears throat> yes, shamans deal with a variety of different things, uh, with healing, using plants, various plants, um, could be plant teachers or hallucinogens or non-hallucinogens, but they also use sound. Whether one is dealing with South American shamanism, North American, African, Asian, or throughout the world, you know, shaman, shamanic societies exist everywhere. And at what point in time, almost all societies were shamanic societies. Up until the development of society, culture, and religions, which basically sifted out ancient traditions. But this is a, a practice that is still thriving, is now <clears throat> uh, gaining more and more popularity, especially in the Western world, in large and small cities. So I wanted to understand uh, how sound, how and why sound was used in shamanic societies, and what is the purpose of the use of sound how they did it, and what instruments they used, what did they play, how it affected the ceremony, and so on and so forth, standing of how uh, Native societies have used sound. All right, let's get into the good stuff. And just so the listeners know, the live feeds this show will be going off in just under 
two minutes again my apologies for somehow accidentally only scheduling the live stream for a uh, 15 minutes it was supposed to be two hours i totally somehow goofed on that or maybe i didn't goof uh maybe block talk had a glitch or something but anyway we will continue doing this show for uh for about another hour or so 45 minutes to another hour without the live feed uh because i know you can go at least that long on blog talk without a without a live feed without um losing phone connection so uh i guess sound meditation aspect it says which raises an awareness to how to specifically design sound can have the ability to help us to disconnect from habitual patterns and guiding people in how to disconnect from the mind in this setting while listening to the specific traditional instruments you play um all right sound meditation you got the floor tell us all about the different types of sound meditations that you focus on what um what kind of uh sounds rhythms beats uh notes specifically if there are any specific notes that are more prominent than others so um tell us all about sound meditation you got the floor so basically sound meditation is an integrated experience that i put together um i use a wide variety of different um uh, concepts uh, i call them tools basically such as breathing exercises visualizations and guided visualizations, toning and vocalization, um, using uh, sound, overtone emitting instruments, and I'll talk about this specifically in, in detail later. I also use, <coughs> um, I work with intentions, and I create an awareness to what one needs to do in the experience, how to listen to sound and what to do with it. And uh, I also use verbal guidance to bring awareness to what's happening in the sound or what may be happening in the mind of the receiver. I do this to keep the person's awareness, the receiver's awareness, focused on the sound because sound and all the other aspects that I talked about in the sound meditation, they're all tools that are used to delve into an altered state, into meditative state, to bypass the habitual patterns of the mind, basically, and to disrupt the habitual patterns of the mind. And uh, the instruments that I use are overtone emitting instruments, such as gongs, Himalayan singing bowls, um, discs and bells, and other instruments that emit harmonic overtones to a clearly audible level. Uh, this is something that I need to explain. Harmonic overtones are <clears throat> aspect of ev and every sound that we hear. Basically, what, when we hear any sound, we hear two aspects of it. <clears throat> the fundamental frequency, which is the note that gives uh, the sound its name. Let's say you're listening to a G played on a violin. You would recognize that this is a, G this is a violin sound because of the overtones encompassed in that G. And the overtones are weaker frequencies that are embedded in the sound to give that sound, that particular sound, its tone color or timbre, which would allow us to differentiate uh, sound of a violin from sound of a cello or clarinet or oboe. So this is for recognition. Now, when you play a gong, you will hear the fundamental frequency and the harmonic overtones, whereas when you play violin or most other instruments, or let's say you hear sounds in nature or you listen to human voice, you don't hear the overtones. You almost never hear them. You hear the actual sound as it is. Whereas if you were to analyze that specific note or sound, let's say the sound of a flute, using a specific software, you can actually see that it has the overtones built in it. And if you were to take these overtones out, the, hum the, the tone color of the note that you're listening to would change. All right, thank you. Let's talk about some specific um, instruments and get really get into the science of the instruments here because you said you mentioned uh, Tibetan singing bowls. Now there is a 11 hour long um, I think it's like 11 hours long on YouTube uh, called Tibetan Singing Bowls. Uh, 
don't know the name of the channel, but it's one of the most frequently um, used uh, uh, list, uh, video, YouTube videos that I listen to for, for meditation purposes and also to help me sleep. Um, do, could you tell us specifically, what is it about Tibetan singing bowls that really puts you in that in that that feeling that sense of relaxation and helps you sleep and is just generally good for 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 meditation and all that uh tibetan singing bowls what and for those that don't know what, what exactly they are why don't you tell us about that a little bit what tibetan singing bowls are and the specific science behind why they work and why they're so um so popular sure um Tibetan singing bowls are more correctly uh, called Himalayan singing bowls because one can find them in Nepal and in northern India, uh, basically around the Himalayas. So um, they're not just Tibetan. They're known to be Tibetan, but they're actually more correctly, uh, one should call them Himalayan singing bowls. So they're basically, they're bowls made uh, <clears throat> out of an alloy of primarily two different metals, two and not seven. Oftentimes, one uh, sees seven metals, you know, related to the singing bowl. Primary metals that are used here, it's basically an alloy that is uh, bronze, and bronze is copper and tin, somewhere between 77 to 80% copper and 20 to 22% tin. And... Uh, about 1% of impurity of five to six other metals could be lead, silver, iron, gold, and, and so on. <clears throat> so they're not really seven because 1% is impurity of about five or six different metals. So it's a bell quality bronze. That means bronze good enough to make bells. Why these two elements or metals? Because these Two metals or bronze would give you a very resonant uh, metal that you can make from bowls or bells, discs of all sorts. And when you play these bowls, they're shaped, they have various shapes, and they're called by the name of the shape. And basically, each bowl would have three variables, the thickness of the wall, the diameter, and the shape of the bowl. And when you play it by either rubbing the rim or slightly below the rim using specific mallets or you hit it with a mallet, you get um, a sound that is very complex containing these overtones. And it's a very soothing uh, sound and it has a long sustain. And basically, um, people who play bowls and these instruments, the instruments that I co uh, named earlier, gongs and bowls and so on, are used by sound practitioners, sometimes called sound therapists or uh, most often sound healers. I tend to stay away from the name sound healing and sound healer because it's not a really accurate description to what's happening. Even though one may experience healing or therapy, relaxation, but healing and, you know, this term is, is very complex and um, unfortunately nowadays it's so often used and it's becoming a gimmick. Um, more accurately, as I said earlier, I, I, I would use uh, sound meditation for such a practice or sound therapy. So basically, <clears throat> we don't know everything we need to know about why they affect human consciousness in such a powerful way. We understand a few things, and I've been doing a lot of research to better understand what happens when we listen to such a sound. First of all, let's talk about what kind of sound you get when you play Himalayan singing bowl or group collection of them. Basically, you have uh, an instrument or several bowls that could be played with different mallets, and they emit these overtones, and the overtones or the harmonic overtone series, has a very complex mathematical ratio. And this series is one of the manif manifestation of intelligence in nature in the same way fractal geometry is and Fibonacci numbers or series. And, you know, mathematics are so involved in, um, you know, everything around us. 
the source code of what reality is. So <clears throat> basically, one can play with these both various notes and construct a soothing sound. But the, what's very important here is to bring awareness to what to do with the sound, what to listen for, and how to use the sound to allow the active participant to be focused on it and to use the sound as a tool to stop the discursive thinking. I, Before I work with people, I give about 30 minute talk to share with people what to do with the sound because if let's say you're playing an instrument, uh, you think that people are gonna listen to it in the most effective way. That's not true, we assume that people are listening to it, but just the fact that people are present while we're playing an instrument doesn't mean that they're actually listening attentively, judiciously. Um, most of the time, what interrupts the listening is all of the tangent thoughts and the discursive thinking that is in everybody's mind. And that is basically what causes stress. And this thinking can be connected to past traumas or in things that can cause anxiety or things that people need to do or various memories and thoughts. So this can cause an overrunning in the, in the mind and can cause fatigue. This is why meditation is very helpful to people because it allows them to focus the mind on the breath if they were meditating while focusing on their breath or focus the mind on a mantra in case they're using a mantra or a sutra or gazing at a candlelight or more effectively focusing on sound, especially overtone emitting instruments to stop the discursive thinking. And in this case, the sound of such instruments, bowls or gongs, given that it contains clearly audible overtones, one would be able to contemplate and focus the listening to what's happening in the overtones. And it's very, very complex. If when you next time you listen to Himalayan singing bowl, even on a recording, there are various variables to the sound that you're listening to. This sound is going to contain low frequency overtones, mid range and higher range frequency. So we're talking about the range, lows and highs. Another variable is the dynamics, the softness and the loudness of these overtones. Of course, the loud ones tend to be more prominent and more easily detectable. The third variable is the wobble or the modulation, the pulsating beat. Uh, the technical word for this in physics is called modulation. So one would be able to observe and, and scrutinize these variables to quiet the mind. One can go between the overtones and perceive them one at a time or two at a time or the entire group of whatever is emanating from that bowl. When you're so focused on it, you will be able to uh, lose awareness of the reality around you and who you are. And what you're listening to, you become that which you're observing. And this is basically one of the deepest states in meditation, which is to become that which you're observing. And to focus on the sensory experience and not, to your, on, not on your thoughts, on the sensory experience. That's very important. Right, right. Uh, by the way, Alexandre, come to think of it, I don't think um, uh, it's going to be necessary for you to come on on a, on a future show. Looking at all the work here, I think we can actually cover everything in great detail in this hour and 15 minutes or so that I'm going to be having you on. So um, you can relax and not have to worry about a future show. Let's try to just uh, cram all this in here. I think it is going to be possible. Maybe the reason um, this accident happened to me is because uh, I don't know if it's really necessary to go full two hours to talk about this, but um, I'd like to keep talking about the um, instruments here while we're at it. Let's try to kill two birds with one stone here. The Aria chimes and the Ignis chimes. I guess um, just like you did with the Tibetan singing bowls, tell, uh, tell the audience specifically for people who don't know the difference or what those instruments are, aria chimes and ignis chimes, what those chimes are, how they work, um, and why are they so good for your specific work? So basically I use, as I said earlier, various overtone emitting instruments. Um, the chimes are one of them. 
So chimes are also used because they do emit overtones, but I also like using them because they demonstrate um, something very important in, in music that I'm going to talk about in detail here, and that's called an ethos. Uh, ethos is a word in ancient Greek that's still in use nowadays. It's spelled E-T-H-O-S. And an ethos is the describing uh, quality, character, um, the spirit of a sound, the, basically the element that would give um, a group of notes a specific spirit or um, characteristics. Take, for example, when you're listening to a piece of music in uh, some major key, C major or G major, to almost every person, a major key uh, can make them feel happy, easygoing, lighthearted, versus minor, which can induce different types of feeling, more a romantic feeling, sad, sense of lament, nostalgia, or spooky to some people. So this is what an ethos is. So these two chimes that I use, and I have several other chimes, um, they're really beautiful, um, resonant. They have beautiful tone color and wide spectrum of overtone. But most importantly, I like the tuning of each of these chimes. And the, these are called Koshi chimes. Uh, and they're made in the four different elements, aria, which means air, ignis, fire, and the other two that you didn't mention, aqua means water, and terra means earth. So um, I personally don't think that the notes contained in these chimes are related to elements. They just sound different. But I use them for the purpose of the fact that, you know, they're, they're different sounding. So when you listen to one chime over another, you feel different emotions because sound has the capacity, the capacity, especially when you're using different notes together, like the notes of a scale of a mo or of a mode. Given that a scale or a mode has different notes contained in it, forming different intervallic structure. Because what's important in a scale is not just the notes; it's the intervals between the notes, which would culminate in the case of major scale, a uh, happy feeling, whereas in minor scale, it would culminate to something sad or romantic. So these chimes sound different from each other. The um, uh, aria chime, and people can listen to it on my website, soundmeditation.com, um, uh, guides people or kind of uh, influence people to to feel um, or kind of directs your emotions because emotions are very important when it comes to music. And the ethos is responsible for that. So when people listen to the aria chimes, they're going to feel some sense of nostalgia, some gentle sadness maybe, um, and the introspective feeling, the sense of lament. Whereas in um, the Ignis chime, one may get some whimsical feeling, uh, sense of um, curiosity, childlike curiosity, um, openness, timelessness, uh, lightheartedness. So sound and scales, as they were used in ancient musical cultures and still being used today, when, I'm, when I refer to ancient uh, musical styles and cultures, that have existed for a long time and that have not been influenced by Western music because there's really huge difference between the two. And that's something I can talk about later if you're interested in. So basically, ancient musical systems such as Indian classical music, uh, Turkish, Arabic, Persian, music of Central Asia, uh, North Africa, and, and so on, are musical cultures that have existed for who knows how long. And their music has been, or at least the classical music, has been impacted to very, uh, or impacted minimally, you know. Western music did impact these cultures' music, but only the pop styles. 
that when you deal with Indian classical music, you listen to ragas, and ragas are modes, where each mode, comparable to a scale, can induce specific emotions because they have different intervallic structures, different notes contained in them. And of using these modes by accomplished musicians is to allow the judicious, attentive listener who is aware of what's happening to listen while meditating and to recalibrate their emotional state by what they're listening to. So sound has the capacity to reset one's emotions, to bring awareness to emotions, because life is hard, and because of you know certain hardship in life, our emotions become sort of calcified, if, you, if, if I can use this word. They become restricted to only a specific spectrum. And if one knows how to listen to these uh, musical cultures, and it takes certain awareness to really know how to listen to Indian classical music, in the same way that it takes awareness to know how to listen to jazz, a lot of people dislike jazz because they don't know how it works. But once they learn about the mechanics of it, then they start to appreciate it. Whereas that might not be always needed for pop and rock. It's music for almost everyone. I cannot generalize this, but for the most part. But basically, it takes awareness to know how to listen to certain musical styles or cultures. Uh, but ancient musical cultures made so much use of the concept of ethos. That's, in short, what I can tell you about them. Thanks you very much. I guess we'll um, keep going with the instruments here. Uh, two gongs, um, Thai gong and Vietnamese gong, Thailand and Vietnam, geographically speaking, uh, in the same area. Um, I'm assuming their gongs would be somewhat similar for that reason, but then again, I... I could be wrong. Uh, a lot of people are um, familiar with the gong coming from uh, from like the Asian countries of like China uh, and Japan, but not so much the uh, Thailand and Vietnam. So th I find this to be quite intriguing here that these are two instruments that you give some honor here on your website, some credence. So uh, let's kill two birds with one stone yet again. The Thai gong, the Vietnamese gong, how they work and why they're good for sound meditation. So basically, I use different gongs from different traditions, different cultures, and different diameters. Uh, these two that you named are small diameter gongs ranging between 10 and 12 inches. I use them because I like them. They're handheld. I do have a wide variety of different gongs, a lot of large gongs as well. Uh, the larger the gong is, uh, the wider the harmonic spectrum, and uh, basically, Yes, gongs are found in a lot of Asian countries, especially the Far East uh, and Southeast Asia, but also Central Asia. Uh, gongs originally came from Mesopotamia, and they were used in ancient Greece. Um, this is as far as we know where gongs come from. Um, it's kind of a bit nebulous, really, the history of gongs and gong making, but it's a very difficult process that involves combining different uh, elements and forging them, creating liquid metal and, and letting it you know, cool, and then it's hammered in a specific process, and gongs can come in different shapes, either disc-shaped or slightly curved or with the gamelan orchestra that's used in... Uh, uh, Bali in Indonesia. So um, you can find them in various traditions. Actually, some of the best gongs uh, found right now are made in Germany by a company called Paisti. They also make uh, cymbals. And uh, they're usually all handmade. All gongs are handmade and hand hammered. Uh, that's why each one would sound differently. So gongs have an old history, and we don't know why people started making them possibly for ceremonies. And it's interesting to note that the bell, you know, and it's a powerful symbol for Christianity, church bell. Church bell is almost like a gigantic um, Himalayan singing bowl or curved gong. <clears throat> you get overtones when you play it, and it's mesmerizing. 
some reason, humans have always gravitated to constructing instruments, whether instruments made out of metal, gongs, or sometimes they made <clears throat> instruments using plant material, and they always went after overtones. They always found a way to bring out the overtones. Um, we subconsciously gravitate toward this it's as if we know subconsciously what we need to make that instrument powerful to, who knows, to induce meditative states and or to alter consciousness in Africa and my field work, and I've done a lot of field work in over 40 countries in different continents uh, as an ethnomusicologist and, and exploring the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound. I've encountered a lot of um, people, a lot of tribes who have constructed uh, instruments. They could be mallet instruments or biras, like the thumb piano, sometimes called. You know, the kalimba is very similar to um, bira. Or harps, where actually you get a buzzing out of the instrument when it's being played. And they tell you as they're playing these instruments, and the buzzing actually brings out the overtone. They say that we're calling the ancestors, we're calling the spirits when, when they play these instruments. So, you know, there's different rhetoric here to what people describe when they play and they use instruments that emit harmonic overtones. So that's really curious how the sound can be described from one culture to another. For us, as Westerners, because we're accustomed to instruments used in sound healing and sound therapy, that is basically overtone emitting instruments, they induce a deep meditative state, an altered state, um, a contemplative state, an introspective state. They affect you even if you don't know how to uh, properly listen to these instruments. But if you know how to listen to them, then you can actually work with what the instrument is trying to induce here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was on mute there, just like I'm always on mute whenever my guests are talking. Um, but uh, I'm using, trying to use your website here to see uh, what we can talk about. I guess we'll just finish up with the uh, with the instruments here. Um, the Sansula. Okay, I must uh, say, say this is the first time I've ever uh, heard that word sansula there's obviously some significance behind it considering you put it here on the website to give it some credence so tell us about the sansula the science behind it what it is and how it helps with sound meditation yeah um, one can use a wide variety of different instruments as long as they're appropriate and what i mean by appropriate here there's really a wide range of instruments that can be used i even use shakers and rattles and rain sticks normally at the end of an experience to bring people back because they do have an earthy element to ground people, whereas overtone emitting instruments, by the way, the didgeridoo is another instrument that emits overtones. It's used in Aboriginal culture in Australia. Uh, the juice harp is also another instrument. One can use the voice as well, whether uh, using overtone singing or throat singing, technical word is diaphonic singing, um, or without any diaphonic singing. So a lot of these instruments can be useful. The sansula is a modification of an instrument similar to the mbira, which is native to Africa. Um, this instrument called kalimba. And it's like a small kalimba mounted on uh, animal skin and on a frame that basically would occasion. More importantly, this instrument can allow the person to produce a wah-wah effect by lifting it up and down when playing it on a flat surface. You'll be able to play small times, and each time is tuned to specific notes. And the combination of all of these times also would produce a specific ethos. And um, I use it because it sounds beautiful and it's useful. I use it, I have. <laughs> many instruments that I use. I've only recorded a few. I mean, I recently recorded a lot of instruments and they will be up on my website at some point soon other than what's up there right now. And people will be able to uh, buy these tracks. I've recorded about seven albums of gongs and Himalayan singing bowls. They're being edited now and they should be up. 
maybe in a month or two, hopefully. And uh, there, there, there will be tracks that people can use to to do sound meditation on their own by listening to them and, and meditating on. It's a lot of care in playing these instruments in an appropriate way to induce meditation, um, grouping them together, uh, small segments of various instruments to form a suite of a uh, group of instruments that can be used for meditation lasting to somewhere between 30 and 50 minutes, and long uh, tracks of uh, just gong or bowls. And um, I also put a lot of care in recording them correctly because these instruments, harmonic overtone emitting instruments, are the hardest instruments to record because um, microphones cannot easily capture the acoustical sound of these overtone emitting instruments. Gongs and bowls really are the hardest instruments to record. You'd need to use uh, more than one microphone, different, and to be able to mix them together to, at the end, produce a sound that is as close as possible to the acoustical sound. And that's a big feat for a recording engineer. Thanks for covering that. Uh, there is one more instrument, but you know what? I'd like to skip over that because there's a few other things I want to try to cram into the last uh, 25, 30 minutes or so that I'll have you on. Um, there is a, a thing here on your site. It says on the resources, Alive Inside, a story of music and memory. Um, okay, we, I think that's some sort of an event, Alive Inside, but I'm not really concerned about the event. I'm concerned about the connection. Between, I mean, if you want to talk about it, by all means, but I'm concerned here about the con the connection between music and memory, because a lot of people might say, okay, there are certain musics and sounds that can enhance your memory. Um, so I guess uh, tell us all the science behind music and memory and what kind of music or what kind of sounds are good for improving memory. Okay, uh, sure. So just to clarify uh, Alive Inside, this is actually a wonderful film that is uh, directed and produced by a good friend of mine, Michael Rosato Bennett, and I highly encourage people to watch it. You can watch it online um, on Netflix, I believe, or Amazon, and maybe iTunes. Um, basically, it's the story of... Uh, uh, senior citizens in senior homes, and um, we all know how much they're drugged up. People suffering from dementia, Parkinson's, and other illnesses. Uh, and basically, in this project, what they did is they gave them uh, iPods filled with music that they used to listen to when they were young. And just the fact of listening to listening to music that they used to love brought them alive. So it's a wonderful and touching uh, film that I highly encourage people to watch. But uh, as for music and memory, a <clears throat> um, few years ago, there was a book that came out about the Mozart effect saying that music, Mozart's music, can make people smarter. And then recently was disproven that it's not really correct. Well, music in general can have an effect on the brain and possibly on memory. That's not confirmed yet. Definitely, music can affect the brain, and that's what I've been studying. So what it can do is quiet the mental activities in the brain, especially if the person is listening correctly and not listening every now and then, and then submitting to whatever the mind is bringing and pursuing a tangent thought and coming back to the sound or music going in and out. Almost all of us listen to music like that. I personally try as much as I can to sit while doing nothing, nothing as much as I can and listen to music, so give music all my awareness. Most people listen to music while driving, walking, and working, studying, reading, even cleaning their apartment. It's not such a bad thing, but we have to keep in mind that we're not fully benefiting from the music <clears throat> we're listening to. The mind is occupied with something else, thoughts or 
focusing on something, on work or on reading <coughs> or on driving, um, it's not the best way. I'm not saying to people, no, you can't do this. You can do it, but just know that you're not getting the most out of what music can serve you and how music can impact the brain. Uh, if you listen to music while giving it your full attention, especially if it's powerful music with a message, uh, with specific lyrics, or and so on, the point here is to give music full attention and to focus the mind on music because that's how one would be able to use the full power of music or whatever one is listening to, could be sound or, or music, to delve into a deeper state than the normal without controlling motor skills, without succumbing to whatever the mind throws at you and so on. So we, that's something that we understand very little about, how sound and why uh, sound impacts the brain. What I've shown in um, a lot of the scientific studies that I've done, and I've done a lot of studies with EEG electroencephalography, which is a method of measuring um, electricity in the brain on microvolt level. And the microvolt is approximately one millionth of a volt, because we know thoughts and, and various emotions are basically electrical impulses, electrical activities in the, in the, in the brain, and uh, chemicals are taking major part in that as well. So when we take someone's EEG, we're measuring the electrical activities that are happening in the brain at that moment in time. And uh, that informs us to a certain level, but we can't tell everything, because EEG measures the electrical activity on the and there are six layers. I also use in my studies EKG electrocardiogram and uh, EMG electric, um, electromagnetic gram, and basically to measure the different levels of activity in the heart and in the magnetic auto energy. So um, we, I'm trying to use as much as possible uh, science here to gain a deeper understanding of why and how sound impacts the brain and the heart as well along with the vagus nerve and the nervous system, autonomic nervous system. We'll keep up the good work. Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, drums for a moment because it seems like drums are one of those instruments that people often think of when talking about putting people in a trance. I remember seeing a documentary on, I think it was Nat Geo where they talked, where they raised the idea that maybe Stonehenge could have been used as a, big drum circle of sorts where the stones were lined up in a certain way to if you bang a drum against it then um the sound will come back in such a way that'll in some sort of a different pattern that could help put someone in a trance so uh what exactly is it about drums and what kind of drums specifically do you need to use if you want to put someone in a trance for lack of a better word yeah they can put someone in trance or an altered state um so basically, when you play drums, drums, uh, most drums have animal skin or sometimes synthetic skin. Whether you're playing frame drums or tall standing drums and various forms of drums, um, and when you play uh, the membrane, you also get overtones. Sometimes, if you really pay attention, you can hear two notes or more going simultaneously, uh, the fundamental frequency would be the most pronounced one. So here you have the overtones, once again, but you also have the various rhythms or pulsations could be steady rhythm without any grouping of notes that would eventually culminate to specific rhythmic mode or rhythm. Um, you have the rhythmic aspect, and that can have also impact on the brain, on the heart, on the entire uh, nervous system and the body as a whole. And uh, we don't know so much how rhythms and what kind of rhythms affect people in which kind of way, but rhythms have always been used to put people in trance, especially through dancing as well. Uh, and there are different types of rhythms. If you're playing one drum, 
you can create certain rhythm if you have several drums involved and each drum has a different part like the way we find them in West Africa then you get polyrhythms and this is one of the most complex textures so usually people dance rarely they sit and listen but through listening to these rhythms and dancing one can alter consciousness and um, but what they do they cause entrainment where basically we find the left hemisphere and right hemisphere being influenced by the specific rhythm or rhythms and the various energies that we have within us and in our body would start to become entrained and um, it's really complex I mean there are so many things that we don't know yet how to explain how to understand uh, connected to sound because it's such a powerful tool because it involves the brain and we know very little I mean we think we know a lot but the brain is the single most uh, or least understood I should say most complex and least understood um, object in the universe um, it's it's a uh, yes there have been many discoveries about the brain, but we still know very, very little compared to what we still need to know about. So we don't fully understand everything. We need more scientific studies to study sound and to, to explain why everybody loves music, why music is the most popular art, why is it so versatile, it has been used in a wide variety of different contexts. It's very enigmatic, and that's why it's worth putting a lot of effort because um, it obviously serves human beings of all cultures um, and all tastes. Everybody listens to music. So to me, this is a powerful tool that with understanding, with research, we can probably explore the therapeutic uh, property on a deeper level. Well, let's try to understand the brain a little bit better because I'm looking here at your uh, EEG pictures to show how different instruments affect different, uh, well, the two hemispheres of the brain in different ways. And I think obviously the most striking thing, of course, is that the um, images on the of both the left and the right hemispheres for for each instrument are different. So, um, I mean, one could, if you ask the question, why is it that the left and the right hemisphere are not affected equally? Well, the simple answer is because they're the, the brain is completely different in each hemisphere. I mean, you've heard the phrase left-brained and right-brained, and anybody in the metaphysics community knows the difference there. But can you just point out a few maybe key reasons why you, from your research, would say that the um, left and the right hemispheres of the brain are each affected differently by a certain instrument in regards to the uh, brainwave and EEG pictures here? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um. <laughs> The shortest answer is, I don't know, but I know some things. Um, yes, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have different functions, even though they, they have uh, parts can exist in both the auditory cortex. The, uh, it's basically found in both hemispheres, and we use both uh, uh, cortices. Uh, auditory cortex is the area in the brain, kind of sort of like above the ear, maybe an inch or an inch and a half above the ear. It deals with processing sound, and it's really very, very complex. Parietal lobes also are found in both. The only part in the brain that is not duplicated in two is the pineal gland, and that's also another enigmatic part of the brain. People have been hearing more and more about the pineal gland often called the third eye. But what happens is that uh, we use the left hemisphere for different functions, for anything connected to logic, um, versus the right brain is more the artistic side, the emotional side. So we use, uh, we are predominantly left hemisphere users, um, but we don't know why sound affects the two hemispheres in a different way or in, e, in the case of EEG uh, measurement the scans would look differently that the left brain is going through 
different processes than the right brain. That's something that we can't fully explain yet, probably because we don't know enough about the brain and we don't know enough about sound. Can, I can say here. Well, you, you gave a good answer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you said, I don't know, but then you give a good good answer to show that maybe you do know more than you think. So congratulations on answering to the best of your ability. Um, another thing about sound, uh, here on your Sound Meditation website, um, I see like the logo here seems to be one of those designs uh, that you would that would form whenever you make a certain sound, a certain frequency, then like uh, sand formation, for example, on a table um, can get formed in a certain pattern if it hears a, uh, a certain sound. Now that's, um, uh, tell us exactly what that is that you're seeing um, wh when somebody um, hit, makes a sound at a certain frequency and it forms some sort of a shape in like a layer of sand or something on a surface. Yeah, here you're referring to cymatics. Spelled C Y M A T I C S. That logo actually uh, looks like cymatics pattern, but it's not. It's a labyrinth, and you know labyrinths come in different uh, forms and, and sizes. This is a famous uh, labyrinth that found in Chartres Cathedral in, in France. Um, I like the labyrinth as a symbol. You know, it has a lot of meaning and significance. Most of the time, it symbolizes uh, one's life journey and discovery, transformation, <clears throat> that journey, you know. So basically, I like uh, that symbol, and I use it um, a lot. But uh, let's talk about cymatics, and um, the listeners can do cymatics.org or watch uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube videos on cymatics. Basically, cymatics are visual depiction of sound. Sound has an image. Uh, and this is something that we've known about since uh, the 16th century. Um, scientist and musician by the name of Ernst Chladni, C-H-L-A-D-N-I, often described as the father of acoustics, and acoustics is a branch in physics that is concerned with uh, the study of sound and sound behavior. He started experimenting with uh, sound. He uh, put powder, very fine pow powder, on thin metallic plate, and he started bowing it with a violin bow on the side. Bowing action started causing the metallic plate to vibrate. And the vibration caused the powder. One can also use fine salt or, you know, fine sand. Started uh, causing this fine powder or salt to move to the area where there is least amount of vibration. And the areas on the plate that were cleared from the sand or powder were the areas that had the maximum amount of vibration. And a specific frequency can give you, and now people can construct a Kladni plate, what's called Kladni plate, and there are instructions. If you go to instructables.com, you can get the instruction of how to build one yourself. It's a little bit tricky, but it's doable. And uh, you can build an ele electrical one where basically you connect it to various electronics that can generate frequency so that you won't have to bow the metallic plate with a bow. And you can subject that plate to various frequencies and you will find that each frequency has a specific visible image. So cymatics are visible sound, but every frequency has a specific signature, a specific sound. Now, it's important here to remember that when you look at it on a plate, uh, you're looking at a two-dimensional image, whereas, in fact, it's three-dimensional. <clears throat> that, that is something that's hard to reproduce unless you get a field full of water and uh, put water in it, and uh, people can, can see similar images of, uh, taken from uh, some studies, experiments uh, that Alexander Alexander. Wasser, 
a photographer researcher who has been interested in cymatics for a while. He um, he actually uh, published a book about cymatics and he experimented with different substances. Um, so as basically uh, Ernst Kladny, there's a great book about cymatics. Uh, <clears throat> I meant to say um, Hans Yeni. Hans Yeni, uh, it's spelled uh, J-E-N-N-Y, if I remember well, um, who was a Swiss-German uh, physician who was interested in understanding um, how sound can heal because of sound. And uh, a book about cymatics came out, and it, it, this inspired Ernst, um, Hans Yen, uh, no, actually Alexander Lauterwasser, Sorry, I'm confusing all these uh, names. Um, basically, um, Lauterwasser experimented on uh, water and alcohol, and I believe on putty as well. So sound can move sand, powder, salt, any fine substance, but also putty and water. Of course, it's not going to be able to move a solid object. You need something that can move around when you subject it to frequency. Thank you. Let's try to fit two more subjects here in the 10 minutes or so I'll have left. Uh, uh, tuning forks. I want to talk about them for a moment. Um, to, uh, tuning forks, if you bang them, they'll vibrate at a certain frequency. But what I'm interested in here is I have a pair of Egyptian healing rods, uh, one made of copper, one made of zinc. You hold them in the right and the left hand respectively, and they're filled with crystals. Um, it says on the, the instructions that came with them, if you share them with individuals, different individuals, you should try to clean them. There's two ways they recommend to clean them. Run them under cold water for maybe about a minute or so and then dry them thoroughly. Or, and I don't remember the exact frequency according to the instructions, but they said hit a certain tuning fork um, of a certain frequency and it will re-energize and decontaminate the um, Egyptian healing rods. Well, what's it, what really interests me about this is I got two different healing rods, one copper and one zinc that, and they're probably filled with the same crystals and the crystal design inside, but they're still made of different metals nonetheless. How is it possible that the same frequency of a tuning fork can heal and recover and decontaminate these two Egyptian healing rods um, equally? You got any theories on that? Um, well, I have something to say. I don't know if it's a theory. First of all, <laughs> uh, we shouldn't believe everything we read. Uh, sound is one of these things uh, because it's so misunderstood, because it's so powerful and mesmerizing. Uh, one can find all sorts of unconfirmed rumors on the internet. Uh, more than anything else, I believe, there are a lot of hooey and hokey things that are connected to sound, unconfirmed rumors, wishful thinking and wishful believing, um, and a lot of things that cannot be proven and cannot be disproven. So um, that's why sound because it's a powerful tool, it's a powerful medium, it begs for more research so that people don't conjuring some sort of explanation, various theories, because there is room for it, because there's no definite way to prove it and no definite way to disprove it. There are a lot of these things about sound healing, so I should warn the listeners not to believe everything that's out there. For example, one of them is the difference between A440 hertz, a standard frequency compared to A432 hertz, um, being the more correct, more natural frequency. There isn't enough of research to quantify and to say 432 hertz is the right frequency for tuning the instrument. This standard frequency has been fluctuating and changing up and down throughout the centuries. If the ancients knew, and I wouldn't know how they could possibly know, because they didn't have electricity, they didn't have uh, tools, equipment to measure accurately 432 hertz. If they knew, let's say, that this is the right frequency and somehow we lost this knowledge, then you would find it everywhere uh, three, four, five, six centuries ago. But uh, history shows us that 
this frequency, the standard tuning frequency, has been fluctuating up and down. This is just one of the things that are out there that people use all the time and they become so adamant and religious about it. No, you can't do this. There's, there's a lot of superstition and a lot of, you know, so I wouldn't necessarily believe what, what this booklet uh, says about this. But having said that, sound is so powerful and maybe it can cleanse or clear any contamination and it can do a lot of very powerful things like that. But we need more scientific uh, data. Why is scientific data valuable? Because basically it allows people to have repeatability. So if, I'm, if I created an experience and I got results, and I did the same experience once again and I didn't get the same results, then obviously there's, there are other factors that I'm not aware of. Until I'm able to produce an experiment that can generate the same data every time I create such an experiment. Someone else in China, someone else and many other people in various parts of the world or in, in the next building can do the same and get the same result. That means that observation is, uh, is uh, showing repeatability. One is able to quantify, and that's really valuable. And that's so hard to do in sound. So I wouldn't know how one can arrive to such conclusion that sound can clear energy. Sometimes reality is in people's heads, but it's not real fact. So someone who does not believe in this uh, is not going to get the same result. So Belief plays a major part in a lot of these superstitious, uh, you know, things that were big and very popular. They were everywhere, you know, a few centuries ago until um, the age of reason happened and, and people started using more and more science. But sound is powerful. Sound, now a lot of scientists are creating experiments and, and showing how sound can be used for a wide variety of different things, for diagnosis to uh, basically, uh, so I'm going to state one of the powerful things that, you know, we have right now that scientists are experimenting with. Sound, ultrasound can <clears throat> thin out the blood-brain barrier, which is the most secure barrier in the brain that filters out a lot of the chemicals and so that they don't go in, into the brain, I believe. But this blood-brain barrier <clears throat> only allows for glucose, oxygen, and a few other elements to go into the brain to keep the brain safe. So now scientists can use ultrasound to thin it out to allow people with um, illnesses such as ALS, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, who take medication, but only a small number of the percentage of the medication they take, uh, 5 to 10 percent, can make it into the brain. But if you thin out the blood-brain barrier with sound, you can allow more of the medication that they're taking to enter the brain and cause the healing. So sound can do powerful things that are previously unexperienced. But I would be skeptical with things that you read on instruments or booklets or on the internet, and there's so, so much of them. This frequency would open your heart. This frequency would do this. This frequency would heal you. You know, 528 hertz is not going to open anybody's heart. Nothing of this magnitude comes this easy, and desperation shouldn't take place, really, because because of our need and and wish to get to a point to believe in such a thing, we cannot become so gullible and so ready to accept just anything we read. So there is a lot of false information out there. Some that, that's out there with good intention, people didn't know, or they did basic research and they arrived to conclusion without repeatability, they generalized it. Or there's a lot of disinformation, wrong information that's out there on purpose to mislead people, not just connected to sound, to various things. 